Hello, everyone. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Welcome to our Office of State Controller's 11th Annual New Year Celebration. Uh, this year, we are doing a conversation with uh, a very important elected official in our state, really in our nation, the Honorable Grace Mang, Congresswoman from Queens County. Uh, we're going to be talking with Grace about the significance of the Lunar New Year holiday, the work she's doing in Washington that uh, impacts not only the Pan-Asian community, but uh, all of us in New York State and in the nation. Uh, before I get into that conversation with Grace, though, I do want to uh, do my best to offer greetings. Grace will, uh, the Congresswoman will, will correct me if I do it wrong. So, Gong Hei Fa Choi for a Chinese greeting. Sin Chao for Vietnamese, An Yang Ha Se O for Korean. I barely do my English well, so I apologize for a clumsy pronunciation there. Uh, but this is the Lunar New Year celebration, a very important celebration. Uh, this is the year of the rabbit, uh, which I'm told is a sign of longevity and positivity. Certainly those are attributes we all wanna celebrate and we all wanna see uh, this year. It's also an opportunity, and that's why uh, we're having this conversation today and over the years we've done uh, celebrations of Lunar New Year to really highlight the contributions made by the Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, the entire Pan-Asian community to New York City, to New York State, and to our nation. Uh, you know, certainly when we, we think about the uh, Pan-Asian community, it is a growing community. Uh, in our city and our and in our state, I know in my own community of Long Island, uh, a big increase in in uh, the Asian population. And uh, you know, wherever you turn uh, in the city, so many of the neighborhoods that have really had the greatest vitality, economic activity, so much of that has been uh, fueled by uh, the Asian community and particularly recent Asian immigrants, the the sense of, wanting to be part of the American scene, the American dream, the entrepreneurship has really been quite something. We put out reports, uh, particularly on the greater Flushing neighborhood and the Congresswoman has been part of those announcements that have really shown greater Flushing has been uh, performing economically pre-pandemic and, and getting out of the pandemic uh, with greater vitality and strength than so many other neighborhoods. And I think that's a credit to uh, the Pan-Asian community. One of the consequences of COVID-19, though, we're going to talk with the Congresswoman about this, has been, unfortunately, and, and frighteningly so, uh, the increase in hate crimes directed against the Asian community, something that we all uh, must condemn and speak out against. So, uh, you know, to those who are celebrating, certainly, uh, Happy Lunar New Year. I know it's a special uh, time of year, and I can't think of anybody better to have a conversation uh, uh, with uh, on this topic and on what's happening than the Honorable Grace Meng. So for the handful of people that may not have heard about Grace Meng, let me just do a, a quick bio. Uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng is serving her sixth term in the U.S. House of Representatives, where she represents New York's sixth congressional district uh, located in Queens County. Grace Meng is the first and only Asian American member of Congress from New York State. Interestingly, she's the first female member of Congress from Queens County uh, since the legendary former Congresswoman, former Vice Presidential nominee, Geraldine Ferraro. In Congress, Grace Bank serves on the powerful House Appropriations Committee, where she's New York's senior member on that committee. She sits on both the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee and the Commerce, Justice, Science and Related Agencies Subcommittee. The House Appropriations Committee, as many of you know, is responsible for funding the federal government's programs and activities. So it's a very important committee, and it's great for all of us that Grace Bank serves on it. Uh, Congresswoman Meng also serves as the first vice chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism, and as a vice chair of the LGBT Q plus Equality Caucus. Prior to being elected to Congress, uh, Grace Banks served in the New York State Assembly, and that's when we got to know each other. Before that, uh, she was a public interest lawyer, and I really got to know uh, Grace Meng when she was in Albany, 
and uh, I'll embarrass her a bit, uh, but I, I've said this to her privately as well. Uh, we all knew that uh, she was destined for bigger and better, uh, not to denigrate time in the assembly because I came from there. So I know it's an important and wonderful place, but you knew Grace Meng was somebody special and no surprise uh, that she was elected to Congress and no surprise that she has emerged really from the beginning of her tenure there as a very key leader for all of us in New York State for all of us in the nation. So uh, it is a privilege to welcome to the conversation, enough talking from me, uh, the Honorable Congresswoman Grace Meng. Grace, thank you for being part of our conversation. Thank you so much, Controller, and thank you, Tom, for always being there uh, for all of our communities. I know you have to go all over New York State, but I think I speak for many people in saying that we know that you always remember each of our communities and you're always there when we need you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and you know, um, I, I know we just went through new, new congressional districts and reapportionment. You know, I was pulling for you to come into my part of Nassau County. You disappointed me. And, and you know, what I appreciate about you, and I, and I you know, do want to thank you again publicly for being part of my swearing in uh, to my new term, uh, you know, you really are someone who is the opposite of those that uh, create cynicism and disenchantment with government. I mean, you are just always an inspiration. So really appreciate your taking time for us to talk about your work. But what I really, I wanna start maybe with a more personal question. Lunar New Year, uh, and, and obviously over the years, I've gotten to appreciate and understand the significance of the holiday more, but, but Talk about it from your perspective. Why, why is Lunar New Year such an important celebration uh, for you on a very personal level, for you and your family? Sure. Well, my parents were immigrants here in the 70s, and I was born and raised here. And as with many immigrant families, our parents and uh, the adults were always very busy. They worked a lot. You know, my dad worked a lot. We didn't get to see much of him during the week. But we knew that come Lunar New Year and the eve, the night before, uh, like Christmas Eve, is when we would have the big celebration. We would all uh, go to our grandmother's house and she would cook up a storm and we would stay up really late at night and all the kids get red envelopes filled with some cash. So it was always lots of fun. Oh, that's great. And I, look, because it's been an important holiday to you personally and to the larger community, I, mean, I, I guess what I remember growing up, we often called the Chinese New Year. Now, I, I think because the Asian community is a very diverse and broad community, I mean, in your own district, right? The number of Korean families uh, that are part of the district, Vietnamese families, uh, it really is a, a holiday of great significance. And you were one of the early voices, uh, and I think it started when you were in the assembly, uh, that really fought to have New York City schools have a Lunar New Year a holiday. And, and, and tell us about how you were able to get, I guess it was during the de Blasio administration for that uh, action to actually happen. Sure, well, it actually stemmed from childhood dreams and complaints of having to go to school the next day all the time <laughs> after a very long evening. Um, and I always wondered as a kid growing up here in New York City, I said, my Jewish friends get off for Rosh Hashanah which I don't celebrate, but trust me, I love getting Rosh Hashanah off two days. <laughs> um, and so I always wondered why our community uh, did not have a day off. And when I got to the assembly, that was one of the first issues I worked on. Uh, and I am grateful to Mayor de Blasio for making uh, holidays like that happen for New York City public school kids. Uh, it's important uh, to recognize as many uh, cultures and holidays as we can, I believe, because it's not just about a day off, uh, as I've learned since growing up, but it's really an opportunity where kids across our city uh, can learn about our different holidays and contributions of various communities uh, to New York. Well, I know what I'm seeing, because outside of New York City, we have obviously many school districts the way we're set up. New York City is a large largest school system, I guess, in the country. But what you're seeing in many school districts across the state now, they are following the New York City lead. So really, you know, the impact of your spearheading that is going way beyond New York City. And of course, my understanding is you're sponsoring legislation uh, in Congress for there to be a, a Lunar New Year Day uh, Act, which would uh, be a federal holiday. Tell us a little bit about uh, how that effort is going. 
Sure. We're taking my childhood dream national. <laughs> we want kids across the country and grownups, too. One of the funny problems that we saw stemming from the New York City school holiday was that parents still had to work. So we had a lot of parents complain to me, um, but nationally, we would love to push for an additional federal holiday. Uh, the AAPI, Asian American community, is the fastest growing community in the country uh, and would love to see that happen one day. And obviously, given your role uh, as an Asian American leader, the only Asian American member who comes from New York, uh, this gives you a very important platform and position to advocate for uh, th that legislation. And also tell us a little bit more about your proposal for the museum and what is the significance of that to you? Sure. Well, a few years ago, we uh, wrote legislation to start the process of having an Asian American museum uh, in Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital. We have seen in instances like with the uh, African American Museum, how popular and how important it has been, not just for the Black community, but for people who come visit from around the country and even around the globe to be able to learn about the history, the culture, and the contributions of any given community to our great country uh, is so important. And so we are grateful to President Biden for signing my bill to begin that process. It will be a long road ahead, but we believe just as we have already begun the process for the Latino and the Women's Museum, that we will one day have an Asian American Museum on the mall as well. You know, the, the issue of, of cultural understanding and appreciation of the diversity of, of our nation obviously is an, an important positive that I, I think we'd all subscribe to. But you know, the past few years, what we've gone through, we've seen some very negative consequences in terms of a lack of understanding. I mean, you have really have been, unfortunately, being on the front lines of the anti-Asian hate, uh, acts of violence, uh, horrible words, and worse than that, assaults as well. And uh, besides being very outspoken, uh, that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with, you were able to uh, work on a bipartisan basis, a two house basis, not always easy to do that in Washington, uh, to pass legislation, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act uh, into law. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit more about that, the process to get that uh, done and accomplished. Uh, was it hard? Was, did, did people understand uh, what a terrible consequence of COVID-19, the anti-Asian hate was? Give, give us a little more uh, insight in, into what, how, how that was able to be a successful effort on your part. Sure. Well, what we've seen over the last few years as COVID began to rise, or even before COVID hit our land here in the U.S., uh, was that people were starting to scapegoat uh, Asian Americans, people who just looked Chinese, whether they were Chinese or not, um, for the bringing the coronavirus here. Um, and that was really largely instigated by uh, one of our former presidents who used really derogatory terms like, you know, Chinese virus, Kung flu, uh, and really uh, put a target on the backs of Asian Americans all around the country. Uh, and so it's been a painful few years. And, you know, we really wanted to try to be as responsive as possible on the federal level. Of course, this is an issue that uh, requires all hands on deck. Uh, and, and to be clear, discrimination against Asian Americans and, and, and many communities is not something new. Oh, I'm not going to pretend it was started by our former president, but uh, it, it really uh, expanded and, and became uh, just so widespread. And so I'm you know, as, as hard as the past few years have been, I'm also incredibly grateful for the allyship that has been shown by so many different community, political, business leaders. You, Comptroller, have always been there for us and have always reached out in our time of need and hurt. And, you know, many other communities, for example, the Jewish community, the Black community, the Arab community, the LGBTQ community, they all reached out with ideas to put together this bill. This bill was not created and pushed 
past the finish line by the Asian community alone. These various uh, underrepresented communities would say things to me like, we know what it's like to be targeted. We know what it's like to be discriminated against um, verbally and, and physically. And so one of the issues that we knew we had to work on federally was to create more data uh, most uh, law enforcement and jurisdictions do not take record or report any hate crimes uh, in any given year. And so, for example, last year, uh, the large cities like uh, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles reported to the federal government that there were zero hate crimes. And we all know that without data, without statistics, uh, what you cannot uh, mend what you cannot measure. And so it becomes really important to have these statistics. We can't ask for solutions when we don't even know the extent uh, in a factual way uh, you know, about a problem. We see things happening if there happens to be a viral video. And so basically we wanted more data uh, collected uh, and more opportunities like hotlines and educational programs, which are part of the bill, to make it easier for people to report these incidents as well. So we're really grateful for the allyship that has been demonstrated um, by so many. I know Chuck Schumer uh, was a great champion, you know, in the Senate, working with you closely on this, and he's always given you the credit for really getting the ball rolling. And it's interesting you, you mentioned data because we actually have done some audits of, of reporting of hate crimes. And we found, you know, exactly as you're pointing out, that there has not been an adequacy of the reporting. Some of that has to do with a lack of training of, of, mm -hmm. of personnel, uh, but an issue with New York City uh, Police Department and, and the State Division of Criminal Justice Services. So I think you're absolutely right. Without the data, it's a real challenge. So so you're the, the only Asian American member of Congress from New York, but you go to Washington and um, I'm sure you've been able to connect with uh, Asian American members of Congress from across the country. How has that, uh, how has that Im impacted your work? I, you know, I, I know you're not alone. We have so many elected officials now, especially from your community, uh, members of city council and, and, and state legislature as well. But to be on the national stage where I, I'm assuming that it's, it's, it's beyond uh, even Chinese and Korean, but you, you probably have uh, truly Pan-Asian uh, colleagues. How, how has that been a, a, an interesting uh, process for you to, to be a part of? Yeah, well, in New York, uh, we've obviously seen a rise in the number of Asian Americans elected to the city council, to the state legislature, which is awesome. When I was back in the New York State Assembly, I was the only Asian, so I couldn't even have my own task force or caucus, <laughs> um, but now they they have one, which is amazing. Um, nationally, we have about 20 members in our caucus. We lost one uh, in 2020, but for good reason. Kamala Harris, who is uh, Indian American as well and Black American, um, got promoted to be vice president. So that's okay. We don't mind losing her. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it is, it, 20 is uh, a, a largest, the largest number ever, but there are still a lot of rooms that we're in and meetings that we're a part of where we have to remind people that our community exists, that we're the fastest growing community and that our needs uh, cannot be ignored. So it is still a challenge. It is still a process. Um, and again, I will say that so many times we have been able to get things done because of allies and friendships um, from our other communities and caucuses as well. So we try as best as we can to be mutually supportive of each other's causes. So I mentioned you know, that you were a member of the state assembly as I was. Isn't it very interesting that the Democratic leadership uh, in the majority in the Senate, in the minority uh, for now in the House, are also former members of the New York State Assembly with Chuck Schumer and now Hakeem Jeffries, particularly for the House? Obviously, your, your role has changed somewhat because going from majority to minority. But having uh, someone who I know is a great partner to you and a great friend, Hakeem Jeffries, as Democratic leader, uh, give us your sense about where uh, you see the House uh, headed now under uh, Hakeem's uh, leadership. But I guess more broadly, uh, given 
you know, the change, the tone that I know could be very troubling. Um, just how do you view the next, I guess, two years in terms of where you see the house headed and, and, and how you see that, that, uh, that New York uh, impact of having both leaders uh, hail from, not from Queens though, but from Brooklyn. But I guess that we, we love our friends in Brooklyn too. Uh, but how do, you, how do you just see that whole, I know I throw a lot at you in that, in that big question, but how, how, do, how do you see all that in terms of where you're sitting right now? Sure. Yeah, it's okay. They're from Brooklyn. No one's perfect. <laughs> uh, but yes, they are both from the New York State Assembly. And I've said to you many times, I treasure so much my time there and the friendships that, that I've made. And being from the Assembly, uh, it's funny because when I first went to Congress, I asked someone where my desk was on the floor. And, and they laughed. They said, you don't have a desk. Like, theater style seating, you just sit anywhere. And I said, when I was in the New York State Assembly, we had our own desks. Um, and I think that, you know, that's just symbolic, but I think that really uh, was one example of how assembly members work together, got to know each other. Um, and uh, it, it's no secret that that is a huge part of the reason why we see our leaders like Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries um, rise nationally. Uh, I'm so proud that our uh, Congress and our House Caucus Democrats are being led by Hakeem Jeffries, who our state knows very well. He is someone that um, uh, I served with in the state assembly as well and has been my big brother every step of the way. And I think with his steady leadership, you will continue to see what we've already seen for the last uh, two months or so, where our Congress, our side is prioritizing community, uh, community over chaos, and making sure that we are waking up every single day, uh, trying to be as united as possible to see what more we can do that day, that week, that month, uh, on behalf of the American people. We are not here to play politics. And I think very soon we will continue to see how Democrats have delivered from the Biden administration on down to all the House districts. Um, we have been trying to every day improve the lives of Americans in all of our districts. Um, no matter how red, blue, or purple they are. And so we will continue to do that, continue to partner with the Biden administration to make sure that we are delivering results um, for people in our districts. We just have a couple of moments uh, left, uh, but I'm, I'm sure your, your relationship, partnership, friendship with uh, your big brother, Lita Jeffries, is really going to be great benefit to your district and to all of us in New York. Last question, just about your, your own district there, which is not just Flushing, but neighborhoods around Flushing. But as I mentioned, we've done, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, when we've done our reports on, on neighborhoods, I mean, the Flushing, greater Flushing community is really such a hub of entrepreneurship and economic vitality. What, where do you see uh, your district right now, uh, greater Flushing community coming out of the pandemic? Just give us you know, your, your sense of what you're seeing on the ground there. We are really excited here in Queens and grateful for so many of the reports that have been put together by you and your team, because oftentimes as we talk about data, your reports help highlight how vibrant and how important uh, Flushing and Queens are to the city and the state of New York. Um, and so we are working on issues that will continue to strengthen Queens and to better connect Queens to the rest of the city and state. Uh, we have been working, for example, on strengthening our infrastructure from things like the Long Island Railroad. We have fixed up some of our stations along our Port Washington line, uh, like Flushing, Murray Hill. Uh, my dream is to open back up the Elmhurst stop on the Port Washington line, which is between Willits Point and Woodside. That would ease congestion and better connect our Queens residents to each other and to the city. Uh, we are also working, unfortunately, still on infrastructure. Uh, Congress members on both sides brag a lot about the infrastructure bill that we passed, but we need to make sure that a good chunk of that money, uh, a proportionate amount, is coming back to Queens and the neighborhoods that were most hurt 
especially during catastrophes like Hurricane Ida. 11 of my constituents died, mm. uh, and we need to make sure that our neighborhoods uh, are seeing that money. And speaking of infrastructure, internet access, which is, again, something that your office did an incredible report on. People often thought of that as an issue that only affected rural America, uh, but that's an issue that affects families here in the city as well. About 30% of New York City kids didn't have access to the internet when COVID started. Uh, so we've been able to secure billions of dollars uh, across the country to make sure that we are, are have our eyes on the goal of collect, connecting every child and every family uh, to the internet, which, which is a right and, and not a privilege anymore. Uh, and small businesses, lastly, um, you know, uh, your reports have highlighted how vibrant our small business communities are. You know, I'm proud to say that even with all the language obstacles and how difficult it was for many of our uh, small businesses uh, to actually benefit from many of the federal programs, that our district uh, received the second highest amount of restaurant grant funding out of the entire New York City. Nydia's got the most, but that's okay because she's a small business chair. <laughs> um, but lots going on in Queens. Oh, it's great. It's great. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, I could keep the conversation going, but I know you're a busy person. Uh, let me just say, uh, Congressmember Grace Bank, thank you for everything you do for all of us. Uh, and thank you just for being so positive. I mean, I, I've never known you not to have a smile on your face and not to be an optimist. I, I, I know how frustrating state government could be. I can't imagine what it's like in Washington these days, but you are someone that always uh, puts a positive spin. You don't give up, you work hard, you do it with integrity, you do it with passion and you get results. I mean, you, you really are just incredible. It's been a privilege to have this conversation with you. I certainly want to wish you and your family a very happy Lunar New Year, and I hope it will be a, a wonderful year for you. We wish you a continued strength. Uh, so thank you for being part of the conversation, and uh, I'll extend to all of our uh, viewers uh, my best wishes to all of you and your families for a very, very happy, healthy New Year, the year the rabbit gung hai, gung hai. Hey, Pa Choi, you got to help me with my Chinese, Grace, down the road. Uh, I'll say Shay Shay, which I know means thank you. And Grace, I'll let you have the last word. You could give greetings to all of our all of our viewers. Thank you so much to our controller again for always uh, highlighting all of our different communities and their diversity, and at the same time bringing us all together. We are proud to be New Yorkers. Uh, we are proud to serve with you, Mr. Controller. And I too want to wish everyone a happy uh, Lunar New Year. Thank you, Congress Member Grace Bang, and thank you all for watching. <laughs>